Okay, yesterday we were talking about orbits, and I had only one or two people come for tutoring last night, and the questions that were about orbits were mostly uh, calculation questions, um, questions about you know, why, uh, you know, why do we do things a certain way. There was, there was very little that was about um, orbits themselves, so I'm going to assume that that kind of was okay. It's not a big deal. Uh, today we're going to kind of continue that a little bit, uh, because although I believe that we... Uh, Got the basics down. There are some more um, important details I do want to talk to you a little bit about. And I want to start with uh, Kepler's laws, actually. Kepler was a mathematician, and he predates the work of Newton, but he is after Copernicus and Galileo. So if you're trying to put that like on a timeline, we know the sun is the center of the universe, but we don't know... Um, why things move the way they do. We have a pretty good uh, grasp on many of the planets, uh, but we have not uh, at this point discovered all the planets in the solar system. We have telescopes, uh, but they're not nearly as, as uh, uh, fancy and capable as they will become in you know, even, more, even a couple of years. But Kepler himself starts off not really as much of a scientist, but as, like I said, a mathematician, and he has access to a lot of data. That's the one thing that's being collected, um, is, is an incredible amount of the data on the motion of planets. He's able to deduce three things from his observations, and they become Kepler's three laws. And what's interesting about them is, although they're not, they're not laws in the sense of what we're used to, they are, they have been proven to be true and therefore are accepted as laws. He didn't have any theoretical basis for it, and a law doesn't have to have a theoretical explanation. It just has to be true and has to have no um, observations to opposition. So, what's amazing is that his laws are shown to be true through observation we see no uh, um, we see no contrary events in the universe uh, but later all of his laws end up being proven theoretically to be excellent predictors of natural behavior so the first law is that all orbits are ellipses all orbits are ellipses so if you're unfamiliar with the term, then you don't remember anything from uh, pre-calculus, and we've come to expect that sometimes, but saying that all orbits are ellipses is um, not a big deal, because we know what a mathematical ellipse is, but when he says that they're ellipses, he's talking more about a relationship between where the central source of gravity is and the path that the satellite will travel upon. Um, he says that the central source of gravity, in his case, for his research, a star or a planet, uh, is going to be at one of the foci of the ellipse, and your satellite revolves around that. And there's a couple of features of an ellipse I think that are important to know here, even though they're not really this is not testable material. Uh, one of them is that ellipses are measured based on their eccentricity, which is a ratio of the semi-minor axis to the semi-major axis. And although I don't think you guys did that in pre-calc very much, talked about those two axes, the ratio of the minor to the major is a measure of how eccentric your orbit is so or how eccentric your ellipse is so the smaller the number the more squished the ellipse is and the further apart the focuses are foci focuses porpoise porpoises porpi we'll go with focuses the more far apart the focuses are no foci the more part uh, who cares I'm not gonna say the word very much today so in a standard orbit um, we've been talking about 
ellipses that have a ratio of the semi-minor to the semi-major of 1. And an ellipse with an eccentricity of 1 is a circle. So although we talked about a special case of an orbit, uh, the circle is an ellipse in the same way that a square is a rectangle. Um, but most orbits, even the moon around the Earth, Earth around the sun, are slightly eccentric. Uh, you start getting out to the, the further planets and they get more and more eccentric. So that's his first law. His second law, his second law we kind of proved yesterday. And it's funny, we proved it for a circle. It ends up being true for ellipses as well. And the law we proved yesterday had to do with a comparison between the gravitational force and the time it takes for a object to orbit. So to take a look at yesterday's law, um, I don't want to use a, an elliptical orbit. Instead, I'm going to use a circular orbit, only because I want to do this really fast since we did it yesterday. And this is because I know that even though I'm trying to keep the class moving, I know not everybody is investing. And I don't want to lose any ground. As much as I say that, it's hard to convince all of you to actually you know, pay attention and do all that, blah, 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 blah. So let's consider the case yesterday. In this case, we have an object at the center, mass of the planet, an object that is orbiting, mass of a satellite. And this could be a planet and moon. This could be the a sun and a planet. doesn't really matter. Um, all that matters is the result. If we assume, and we are, that the force of gravity towards the center is the force that is causing centripetal motion, then we can say that the net force is equal to ma where this is mac that net force is caused by gravity so mass of planet mass of satellite g over r squared and that has to be equal to in this case the mass of the satellite that's the thing that we're watching in its orbit and v squared over r represents the centripetal acceleration again i'm going to emphasize that these two R's don't represent the same thing unless, in the case of your problem, they do. This represents the separation distance. And this represents the ra uh, radius of curvature. So in the case of a circular orbit, these are true. Um, in the case of an elliptical, uh, they wouldn't be because the rays of curvature is going to be changing all the time. Um, and the, we're going to see a case today where these two things aren't the same and you have to change kind of your, your approach. So assuming they are the same, back this out a bit, then we could find an expression for the velocity. Uh, cancel out the mass of the satellite, cancel out one of the R's, and we get that the velocity squared is equal to mass of the planet, g over r. But remember, we wanted to go one more step, which is to find the period of that rotation, which meant setting v equal to 2 pi r. This is the radius of curvature again, because it's the path that we're going on, divided by t. So subbing that in for the velocity, we got... 2 pi r over t quantity squared. And here's the gist. Uh, when I square that and I get m p g over r, I get 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. And all I'm going to do is cross multiply the denominators. Let's see if I can just move that to the side. There we go. Cross multiply the denominators and I get mpgt squared equals 
four pi squared r cubed. And that brings us to what Kepler said. Kepler, second law, found that while observing the planets and looking at their distance away from the sun, he said that there is a ratio of the period of their orbit to the cube of their radius. So if you looked at the planets, you could conceivably figure out where they should be based on how long they're going around the sun or reverse uh, how long they should be going around the sun based on where they should be. Uh, interesting, when combined with some other information, this could be successfully used to help figure out where to expect other planets. And so this is something that Kepler's laws are famous for trying to do. Because he, he also recognized with this that there were, there seemed to be a spacing to the planets. And there were places where the planets should be based on that spacing. Uh, they're not haphazardly placed, it appears. Um, but also, in looking at, I mean, some of the planets had very long periods, something that couldn't be observed in the span of a human lifetime, but he was still able to predict what those periods were because he could measure how far away from the Earth and therefore how far away from the Sun they were. So, Kepler's first law, there's ellipses. Kepler's second law, there's this ratio, which we talked about yesterday. Kepler's third law, we're going to talk about today, and it concerns your favorite subject, angular momentum. And in order to, to know why I wrote that down, let's uh, go back to an ellipse for just a minute. Why is it like that? Uh, do, 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 do. Arrange, edit, ungroup. Choose just this one. Okay, so I've got a star and a planet that is traveling on a very elliptical orbit. And I'm not gonna be able to prove this to you now but this was his law. What he said was, if you connected a line between the star and the planet and timed it, so you, you know, said, okay, I'm gonna see where the planet is over the next five days. So the planet moves over to say here in five days and connected to another line. And then did that everywhere the planet went. So say the planet was over here. Oops. Say the planet was over here. And you connected that line. And then waited for it to move five days. What he said was that the area swept out. So this area swept out as the planet went from here to here. Would be equal everywhere in its orbit. So if you consider that this area is very long and, uh, and kind of narrow, in order for the planet when it's over here to sweep out the same area in five days, it's going to have to move further during those five days in order to sweep out the same area it did back on the other side of the star. So this would have to be a wider triangle in order to accommodate the same area. In fact, what his law says is that objects in orbit sweep out equal areas in equal time. Now, a big implication of this, and he didn't have, remember, force or momentum or energy to work from, so he was just doing this from straight observation. But the implication is that the planet travels faster when it's closer to the star and slower when it's further away. And we can imagine that to be true. The influence of gravity is less when you're further away. So it doesn't take as much force to turn you, therefore you don't have to be traveling as fast. 
Also, consider when the planet is here. When a planet is here and it's traveling this way, the force of gravity has a component that is backwards. So if that's the velocity and that's the force, there is clearly a component of the force this way. And that component of force is slowing the planet down. Contrarywise, when I'm on the other side and the velocity is this way, the force of gravity still towards the sun is going to have a strong component of that force in the direction of motion, and therefore the planet is speeding up. He had no concept of force back then, so he just did this purely on observation. We are going to find out that there's an angular momentum component to this. Demonstrative purpose. Okay, today's topics. First, it wasn't a lie. Somebody, I know, lies are wrong. I wasn't trying to trick you yesterday, but I wasn't telling you the whole truth either. Um, yesterday, I was talking about the Earth Moon system. And I was indicating that in the Earth Moon system, the orbit, which we calculated to be about 27 days, what, that was based on suggesting that the moon orbited a point at the center of the Earth and went around in some big circle around that point. Um, that's not exactly what's happening. And although this is a, this is a very poor picture of the Earth and the moon, um, remember the, the moon is, I'm sorry, the Earth is like 6e to the 6 meters and their separation distance is like 380 e to the six meters. So that's a difference of like 80. I'm sorry, that's a, a ratio of like 80, which means the separation distance between the Earth and Moon is about 80 times its radius. So if I really wanted to, to make this look correct, for this, I think I want to stick with this picture because it's easier to see what it is I want to talk to you about. And that is that the Earth and Moon are a system. The Earth isn't fixed in place. Therefore, this system, as we talked about with systems, will rotate about the mutual center of mass of the planet and the Moon, which is not in the center of the Earth. I'm gonna say that all over again because you guys won't hit rewind and you need to make sure that's in your notes. Um, this system does not rotate about the center of the Earth. It rotates about a point located between them because for an object that's not fixed in, you know, in the ground, that there's no fixed pivot point, a system oscillates about the center of mass of the system. So we talked about when we talked about rotational motion and the center of mass of this system is located near the surface of the Earth. That means the radius of curvature for the moon is this distance, radius of curvature. Now we would get that from the center of mass formula. You know, if we set this as the origin, then we would do mass of the moon times zero, because that's the origin, plus mass of the earth times the earth-moon distance, all divided by the mass of the moon plus the mass of the Earth. Now we're not going to do this problem uh, because I, I don't see a need. I don't think it's gonna it's gonna change our answer, but only by a couple of hours. But I, I want to go back and set it up for just a minute so that you understand the difference. Um, M for the Earth, M for the Moon, G over the separation distance squared equals mass of the moon times v squared over, in this case it'll be the radius of curvature, now we uh, change v, so v is going to be 2 pi, this is radius of curvature, over place that inside here after we square it uh, 
It's gonna be complicated. Let's give me some space to work. So M E M M G over R E M squared equals M M over R C times four pi squared R C squared over T squared. I know, I know, I know. Cancel out the M's. Cancel out one of the R's. Okay. And now I can, if I wanted to, I can get a, a relationship for the period. And I'm just going to do what I did before. I'm going to multiply both sides, or across multiply both sides, this way and this way. And I will get M E G times T squared equals four pi squared R E M squared times R C. Now, if it was a perfect system and it rotated about the center of the earth, it would have been M E G T squared equals four pi squared R E M cubed. That's the difference. I know it doesn't look like much, but it's enough. This number is smaller, which means the period we actually found was too long by a couple of hours. Now, you might not understand why that makes any difference. I mean, it makes a huge difference if you're trying to land on it and you want to know where it's going to be. Of course, we don't need an equation to tell us where it's going to be. We've got thousands of years of empirical evidence telling us where it's going to be. I'm sure we could have landed on it. But you should be a little bit concerned about the fact that what we found was that the moon goes around the earth every 27 days, yet its full moon cycle is every 28 days. And we talk about the fact that it's 28 days. And in trying to get a more accurate representation I'm telling you now, being more accurate will actually make our answer further away from what we know to be true from observing the moon. So why is it that it's 28 days from full moon to full moon? Well, glad you asked. I, you didn't ask, but I'm the teacher and I get to decide what to tell you. Uh, Let's put the sun here. No, that's not a sun. Let's put the sun here. So there's our, our happy little sun. Should be wearing shades, right? There's our sun. And he's happy to see it. So the sun's over there. Let's say that we're at the full moon right now. So here's the Earth, not drawn to scale. And here is the moon. For, for us to see a full moon, the moon has to be behind the Earth. Let me draw this right there, behind the Earth. Come on, let me draw behind the earth so that the light of the moon there, so that the light from the sun is visible on the earth so we get a full moon when the moon is behind the sun and the rays from the sun pass around the earth now the the moon isn't perfectly in the same ecliptic as the Earth, so we get full moons all the time, not eclipses all the time. If the moon was always, it was in the perfect plane of the ecliptic, uh, meaning that everything was on the same plane, then every time the moon went behind the Earth, we would never see a full moon. We would see a lunar eclipse, but we don't because they're on different, slightly different ecliptics, and that allows us the light to pass by the Earth so we can see the moon. Now, we know that a full moon will occur again when the moon goes all the way around the Earth back to the same position. 
which we have calculated to be 27 days. The reason why the full moon isn't every 27 days and is exact, actually every 28 days is because the Earth doesn't stay there. During the time that the moon is going around the Earth, the Earth is also moving. And because of that, and let's, let's, let's you know, grab another Earth here real quick. Because of that, the Earth will have moved one twelfth of its orbit. Now, let's draw that line back through here so that we have a point of reference. There's our point of reference. If the moon came back to its original position after 27 days, which it does, it would be, let's try and line them up so they look exactly the same. Try to make sure the angle they're making is the same. When I say the same, I mean the same. There, give me a second. There. So, this, I'm trying to make this angle the same here. So they're facing off at the same, like these lines should be parallel. Because that's when the moon has come back all the way around and made a perfect circle. But the problem is it hasn't moved quite far enough to get to the point where it's going to be a full moon. It has to move a little bit more. And it is that little bit more that makes it take 28 days between full moon cycles, even though it only takes 27 days for the moon to go around the Earth. So sometimes the explanations are just because there's other things happening and not because we're making a mistake in our calculation. Okay, that's a lot for now, but we're going to move on because... Okay, we're going to talk about elliptical orbits and we're going to compare them a little bit with circular orbits and talk about some similarities and some distinct differences. So yesterday when we were talking about circular orbits, one of the things I tried to emphasize was that there's a balance between the force of gravity and the velocity of the planet. And that in a circular orbit, it is the force of gravity that is causing centripetal motion. So the planet travels in a circular path due to that force. Uh, this force isn't inconsequential. It's large. So we tend to think that things are just floating around in space and that that's, not, that's a misnomer. They float because they're continuously falling and so that's what makes them appear to float because everything that's around them is also floating. Like the earth is falling around the sun all the time, that kind of thing. But it's not hard to, to recognize that first, the, in a circular orbit, it's likely that the velocity stays constant all the time. Uh, that would suggest a couple of things that I think are, are probably obvious. Like it has the same kinetic energy all the time. It's traveling in a circular orbit. Um, moreover, the object's angular momentum is a constant all the time. And if we think of the angular momentum here, the, the way we would calculate it is based on either assuming the object is a point mass, which I think that's not a bad assumption. We can use the point mass formula to calculate the angular momentum, which in this case, r perpendicular would just be rmv. And yes, we can calculate v by going back and doing what we talked about yesterday and looking at the force of gravity and such. But I just want to point out that, you know, for right now, we can say that there is this way to calculate the angular momentum. And I know, yes, related to gravity. Put that aside for now. Um, you could also calculate it using I omega. Uh, that would be fine too. Um, you know, we could write this as a point mass m r squared times omega. But remember, omega is v over r. So do a quick substitution and we get m r squared v over r. So uh, m v r. 
So whether it's MVR or RMV, uh, they're the same. So regardless of whether we use angular momentum for a point mass or whether we use the standard angular momentum for a rigid body, you get the same thing here for a circular orbit. And since the velocity is constant and R is constant, the momentum of an object in a circular orbit is also constant. Now, it might not seem obvious. So let's point out a few things about an object going around an elliptical orbit. First, oops, first, let's assume a couple things that I think might seem obvious to you, but aren't maybe obvious. Um, when it's in an elliptical orbit, it's experiencing a force as well. But the distance between the planet and the star are changing. And I'm going to say planet and star. It could be planet and satellite. It could be, you know, two stars. I, I, I don't want to, to focus on one thing. But let's just ensure they understand that there is a possibility that there's an interaction here. Now, there's a force in this direction. Uh, it has a velocity again in this direction. Now, the thing is, at this moment, its velocity is not, uh, I'm sorry, is, is too fast for it to be in circular motion. If it was the right speed, then it would fall into a circular path around the planet, or sorry, around the star. But it must be traveling too fast, which is why it's falling outside of that boundary and passing further away. So this isn't a system in balance. This is a situation in which the planet and the star are interacting, but they are not interacting with this perfect balanced force and velocity. So when it's here, its velocity is, is, is too fast. And what's funny is that it's going to get faster for a little bit. I'm sorry, it's not gonna get faster. It's gonna start getting slower as it passes around the outside of the star. It's gonna reach places like here where the force is backwards. So it's got a component this way, which is going to be acting against the direction of the velocity. So eventually the planet makes it over to here and it's gonna have a smaller velocity than it had over here. Now that's important because the force now is also smaller because we're further away. But in order for it to be in circular motion here, it would have to be traveling faster. And because it's not, it falls below the speed that it would have to be at. And this might be hard to see with this small picture here. So let's consider a bigger picture of this. All right, let's consider this. I have a rocket ship and the rocket ship is located here and it is in a low orbit around the Earth, a low circular orbit around the Earth. So right now its velocity and its, its, the force of gravity are perfectly matched. And it can continue to travel in this circular path indefinitely because the force and velocity are perfectly balanced. Now, you'll notice I've drawn an ellipse here that represents what would happen if when the spaceship makes it to here they suddenly decided that they wanted to go faster so they fire their engines for just a second you know just enough to increase their velocity well if they do that they're now going to be going too fast to stay in that circular orbit and thus, their orbit opens up so that they're going outside of the orbit they would have been traveling on. They're too fast for the force that's acting on them to pull them into a circle. Now, as they move outside the circle, that force is going to actually slow them down, but they eventually will make it to a point like right here. Now they're traveling slow, so they're not gonna travel in a circle right away. They're just going to fall back 
along this path and now they are traveling in this elliptical path. Now while traveling in that elliptical path, they travel fastest here with the greatest amount of force acting on them at that moment. And they travel slowest here with a weaker amount of force acting on them. But the force is still strong enough so that if they wanted to travel in a circle, they would have to travel faster. And so they continue in what we'll call orbit two, the elliptical orbit. Now again, they can do that indefinitely. Of course, if they wanted to switch to a circular orbit, they could wait till they get back to here and hit the engines again and increase this velocity. If they do that, that will open up their arc. And if they do it just right, they'll switch to orbit three. And now they'll be back in a circular orbit. This is how you dock with the International Space Station. You go into a low Earth orbit first and you make sure everything's working okay. You don't go right out to it. You make sure everything's working okay. And then when you know the space station, you know when it's on its way, so there's a space station, and it's making its way up there, you time yourself so that you hit your engines and come out into a higher orbit and try and meet the space station right when you need to. Obviously, before that time, you are in the lower Earth orbit and you're going around faster than the space station is, so you can pick your moment when you decide to go from one orbit to the next. You don't have all the time in the world. They launch in specific windows when they know they're going to have opportunities to change orbit and meet the space station. But let's keep going with this. So let's say we have now transitioned our spacecraft and it's traveling in orbit three. So the spacecraft is now traveling faster than it was. It doesn't have to keep its engines firing because it's out in this higher orbit. It's traveling faster than it was at the lower orbit. And although the Earth's gravity is, is less, um, it's at a higher orbit, so it has to make a bigger circle. Let's say it's time for them to go home. And so they want to now transition from this high orbit to a lower orbit. Well, they'll have to spend a moment turning the spacecraft around because they need to slow down. So they are careful to get the spacecraft turned to face backwards. So they still have a velocity in this direction. But right when they make it here, they hit the engines again to slow them down. Then they will fall back into orbit two. Of course, now that they're in orbit two, when they get all the way to here, They're going too fast to be in orbit one, that low Earth orbit, so they will have to hit their engines again. This gets them into a stable lower Earth orbit. Or let's say they want to, to land. Well, they could slow down even further and drop themselves into an even lower orbit. Perhaps one that would, you know, intersect the Earth. So under this circumstance, we create orbit four, <laughs> which isn't an orbit at all. It's a crash landing with the Earth. So the first thing I'll say, this is how we transition from orbit to orbit. But also, it gives us an idea of how there's a relationship between the velocity you have and where you are in your elliptical orbit. So let's talk just about the elliptical orbit for a minute. minute. And highlight some important places. So let's talk about our spaceship here. 
our spaceship here. Let's say they're not firing their engines, they're just in an orbit. There, we got a couple of other spots here. So, some things I would like you to know when they're at the closest approach. So, when they're at their closest approach, their velocity is the greatest. We'll call that VC for closest approach and RC for closest approach. But when they're at their farthest, their velocity is the smallest. We'll call that VF for farthest and RF for how far away they are. And when they're in the middle, they're transitioning. On this side, the force of gravity is speeding them up. And on this side, the force of gravity is slowing them down. So obviously, kinetic energy is a max here. And kinetic energy is a minimum here. So on the way out, gravity is taking away kinetic energy. And on the way back, gravity is adding to the kinetic energy. But orbits, first they conserve they'll spell better. Orbits conserve momentum, angular momentum, and they conserve energy. The gravitational force is a conservative force, and the way it acts on the rocket doesn't apply a torque. Because in any one of these cases, the force is along the line that connects them. Therefore, no torque. So, the angular momentum of our spaceship when it's close has to equal the angular momentum of our spaceship when it's far. So, RC times MV close has to equal RF times MVF when it's far. There is a direct relationship between the change in the radius and the velocity. And this is true everywhere in the orbit too. So even on the sides or someplace else where it's transitioning, the angular momentum stays the same. In addition to that, the kinetic energy plus the potential energy also equals a constant. This is the potential energy when close, this is the potential energy when far. That's a discussion for tomorrow, and that will complete our discussion. But I want you to be aware that this discussion about energy is going to be a little weird tomorrow. I want you to be a little prepared for that. But you should take a moment and digest this, and keep this in mind and this in mind, and understand the relationship between the velocities and the distance. All right? Um, I've attached an FRQ to this, and it's right in line with this. It is about planet Jupiter, and it is an, it's not a particularly old FRQ, but it's, it's, a, it's a good one. So I want you to, to spend a little time on it. It's got all sorts of the, the gravity stuff, the way they ask the gravity stuff, you know, in this, in this particular part of the chapter. It's, it's not, you're going to find that gravity stuff, if it's asked, is usually asked pretty lightly. But there is a thing tomorrow that if it's going to be asked is kind of confusing. Tomorrow is the most important part, but tomorrow is also our last conversation about gravity. Well, let's make the Earth that big and assume that it's, you know, its radius is a little tiny thing right there. So that would make the moon have to be, you know, Something that's about 80 times that distance. I'm not sure that's 80 times. I think 80 times is probably further away. So maybe right there with the moon being an itty bitty little tiny little thing over there. That's probably more close to the Earth moon distance. So, you know, although we tend to think of them as big and close, and the moon is really big compared to the Earth when we compare it to other planets that we've seen, you know, when we compare it like, like this, you tend to think of it, wow, it's, there's, it's mostly empty space. And it is mostly empty space. And it's amazing how incredibly huge it is in our night sky, considering that there is this kind of ratio of its size 
to the distance away. 